Please. Sorry. Okay. All right. So we're happy to welcome uh, Dono Arapura. He will speak on ILR characteristics as aspherical killer manifolds. Take it away. Okay. Well, thanks. Yeah, sorry about the rough start. I uh, I forgot how you use uh, Zoom. It's, I'm teaching in person this this semester, but anyway. Um, so Euler characteristics of Kähler manifolds. That's the title, and uh, let's see. If, so this is joint work with Botong Wang. And uh, in case you want to look at the details, that the, we put the preprint about a month ago on the archive. And has this rather long title, but uh, I'll tell you roughly what's going on. Okay, so yeah, so let's let me start with some very classical differential geometry, and uh, that's like a sister subject to algebraic geometry. So hope you'll bear with me. So the Gauss Bonnet theorem: if X is a two manifold, and I mean a real two manifold with a Riemannian metric, then the Euler characteristic. Um, I should have said compact probably, but the Euler characteristic is one over two pi times the integral of the Gaussian curvature. And as a consequence, the sign of the curvature equals the sign of the Euler characteristic in two dimensions. So, um, so you can ask what happens in higher dimensions and maybe a few words, <clears throat> uh, if X, has odd dimension, then by Poincare duality, and I guess I should use the word uh, X is compact and uh, orientable and so on. And by Poincare duality, the Euler characteristic is zero. So it's an only, only interesting if X is even. And with that, let me mention this conjecture of Hoff from, I think it's 1932, early 30s. So let X be a compact Riemannian manifold of uh, dimension 2D. And there's two versions. So the strict version is suppose the sectional curvature is negative. Then if you adjust the Euler characteristic with the correct sign, then it's positive. And there's a, what I'll call a non-strict version. I mean, they're really two parts of the same conjecture. If you have non-positive sectional curvature, then uh, the same expression has Greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so I guess maybe if you can see my hands, Gaussian curvature looks like that. So the saddle is like a negative curved. And then in higher dimensions, the easiest thing is to restrict the curvature to, to two planes or to two manifolds, and that's the sectional curvature. Um, yeah, so let me make a few remarks. So presumably Hoff had already lots of examples that he tested on. So tori, of course, and certain locally symmetric spaces. Uh, and it's true in dimension four, and uh, apparently this is due to Milner. And the obvious generalization is to look at the gauss bonnet There's also a higher dimensional version due to churn. And then you just play with that and show that the integrand has the correct sign. But this direct approach is actually known to fail in higher dimensions as soon as you're about six, in the sense that there are examples where the, the local expression could have the wrong sign, but presumably the integral could be correct, right? So, so uh, maybe just a, this is, a, classical result that I, I just want to introduce the next conjecture. So if you have non-positive curvature, that implies that universal cover is diffeomorphic to Euclidean space. So it's uh, contractible. Uh, and then that suggests the next conjecture, which I'm gonna add Singer's name. So let X be a compact uh, manifold uh, of dimension 2D again and assume that it's a spherical. A spherical just means that the universal cover is contractible, maybe Euclidean space, maybe something else, but contractible. Um, then the same expression we had before, uh, minus one to the D times the Euler characteristic is greater than or equal to zero. 
Um, so that generalizes the uh, previous conjecture, but actually Singer conjectured something stronger, which I don't really want to talk about, but I'll just say it just for uh, background, that certain L2 Betty numbers, whatever they are, uh, are zero except in the middle. And this would actually explain the conjecture. And if you combine it with a suitable index theorem due to a TIA, then you get the, the conjecture I stated above. All right, so let me, so this is algebraic geometry seminar. So if you don't mind, I'll, I'll go slightly bigger to Kähler manifolds, which, which are slightly generalized projective manifolds. So, um, so from now on, if I forget to say it, X is a compact Kähler manifold. So for example, a smooth projective variety over C. So some, some uh, previous results, and this is not that long ago, at least from my point of view, Gromov in 1992 proved the strict form of the conjecture, which maybe by now you've forgotten. Uh, let's see if I can say it. This one here, number one that if you have negative curvature, then you have uh, the strict inequality. And um, yeah, so he actually proved uh, the conjecture of Singer, which is stronger. And uh, so a vanishing plus a non-vanishing theorem. And then the non-strict version was proved uh, already in this, uh, this millennium. So it's getting closer by, uh, Kao and uh, Xavier and Yost and Zul. And so I think they did this independently um, and they used a modification of Gromov's method. So it's, from my point of view, fairly uh, tricky analysis. So um, now I'm gonna switch gears and maybe this is gonna be a little more comfortable for a, algebraic geometry audience. So, I'll, but I'll, I'll still try to remind you what these words mean. So perverse sheaves uh, are nice objects in spite of the name in the constructible drive category. So they're neither perverse nor they're sheaves, but that's, we're stuck with the terminology. And so examples are locally constant sheaves and you have to shift these things by dimension, but ignore that for now. If you actually want the definition, here it is. So uh, an object in this category is perverse. If you look at the support of the cohomology, well, it looks a little bit strange, but it's natural. The, so the minus ith cohomology of P and the support, it's supported in uh, dimension less than or equal to I. And it's self, the conditions are self-dual. So you apply the same thing to the Verdier dual. And if you look back at the example, Two, then uh, these examples are satisfy the, the previous uh, number three. And this also explains the shift because uh, you have to sort of center it in the, under Verdi duality. All right, so, right, so perverse sheaves. And then um, from my point of view, one natural source comes from D modules. And I won't go into the, the details, but for whatever reason, there's an equivalence of categories between perverse sheaves. These are complex valued perverse sheaves and a, and a certain category of D modules called holonomic modules, which I'll explain in a moment. And here D is the sheaf of linear differential operators. Maybe I should do this to make it easier to follow uh, on X. So I, so X again is a complex manifold or a Kähler manifold. Actually, Kähler won't matter right now, but definitely complex. So these are linear differential operators with holomorphic coefficients. Okay, so, uh, so if you want to think concretely in a section of D looks like one of these expressions. So I'm using this notation to save writing. So these, these Ds are just derivatives with respect to coordinates. So I'm using the local coordinates and these uh, coefficients are holomorphic functions. So I'm just gonna give, it, give you an ad hoc uh, definition. So if you take this, you'll have uh, uh, expressions of various orders. Uh, 
but look at the leading order term, the highest order term. And you, you're going to treat that as a function on the cotangent bundle. So the point is that these are vector fields. So vector fields are dual to cotangent vectors. So just view it as a polynomial on the cotangent bundle. So to get something geometric, you can take the zero set um, of that. And this is called a characteristic uh, variety. And just to incorporate D modules, it's actually the D module that you get by taking D mod DL. Uh, I don't wanna go into too much details, but you can ex extend this to more complicated D modules and uh, you define characteristic varieties in a maybe a more reasonable way. It'll, it'll be a subset of the, of the or actually a sub variety of the cotangent bundle. Okay. Um, so, and then holonomic, which I alluded to before, uh, means that this characteristic variety is uh, Lagrangian, which, which means that, uh, well, it, it could be singular, but away from the singularities, it's, it's a maximal isotropic uh, with respect to the symplectic structure on this cotangent bundle. So in particular, if you don't like the word Lagrangian, it means that it's, a, it's the dimension of this variety is exactly half the dimension of the cotangent bundle. And for some reason, M, was you twice, this should have been an X, but so change that to an X in your mind. But M is a, is a different object, M is the module. Um, yeah, so actually this is M, but that's, that's X, sorry about that. Anyway, so the, this, uh, this construction can be refined to give an effective Lagrangian cycle called the characteristic cycle. So may, maybe I can say it, I didn't write it, but uh, so to actually do, do this rigorously, you, you take the associated graded of M with respect to a so-called good filtration. And the characteristic variety is just the support of that. And the characteristic cycle is, is more like the scheme, scheme theoretic support of, the, of this. Uh, all right, so, uh, so then the Riemann uh, Hilbert uh, allows us to, basically it, like there's a bijection between perverse sheaves and uh, D modules. So whatever construction I made for holonomic D modules, I can apply to a perverse sheaf. So this allows us to change this funny looking homological object into something more geometric, namely a subset of the cotangent bundle. So I'm saying this for a reason, but it'll, it'll appear later. So now let's make a, con a conjecture. So this is a conjecture in, the, in this form, it's due to uh, Botong and myself, but there's a sort of a previous version for projective varieties due, due to the last three authors. So let's now take the context of the, the Hopp-Singer conjecture. So X is a, a spherical compact Kähler manifold of dimension. This is a complex dimension D. All right, so it's exactly the same hypothesis as the Hopp-Singer conjecture. But now we change the, the conclusion. We say that for any perverse sheaf on X, uh, we have this inequality. And notice that the minus sign has been absorbed into P and the reason is that uh, there's a shift in P and that, that takes care of the minus sign. So, okay, so this is the general conjecture that we have. Um, it, it implies the previous conjecture and maybe I wrote that, so yeah. So if I take this particular sheaf, perverse sheaf, just the constant sheaf shifted by by the dimension, then that gives you back Hoff, Hoff Singer, but you can apply this to all kinds of other things. And so it gives you much more, much more flexibility. Okay. So what, what are the results? So our first result uh, is that, uh, so it, it doesn't have to be a spherical as written. So let's say X is a compact Kähler manifold. 
and uh, okay, so there, there's a bunch of words that you can ignore, but the key point is non-positive. So let's say that X has non-positive holomorphic bisectional curvature, whatever that means. And then uh, for any perverse sheaf, we get the conclusion of the previous conjecture. Right, so then there's a strict version. So let's say that X has negative holomorphic bisectional curvature. Again, you can ignore these adjectives if you like. So negative uh, curvature. Then for, uh, or maybe a more algebraic geometric uh, condition, which is better for this audience, is if the cotangent bundle is ample in the usual sense of Hartshorn, then uh, the conclusion is for any perverse sheaf, we get uh, strict inequality for the for the characteristic. Okay, uh, so that's- Dono, may I ask a question? Yeah, of course. So uh, the in the first case, the non-positive, is that equivalent to the cotangent bundle being uh, NAF or semi-positive? It, it actually implies that it's it's not- oh, so it's well, stronger. It's, it's stronger, that's right, it's stronger. Uh, is it so, maybe uh, Nakano semi-positive or? Uh, okay, so it's Griffith's, uh, it's Griffith's semi-positive. Okay. So it's so, somewhere, you know, there's, there's a whole- Somewhere in between, okay. Yeah. So it's not the strongest, which is Nakano, but it's- uh, and, and Just one more thing. Could you just for a second, go back to your conjecture? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think I may be going too fast, yeah. but it's, this is- No, yeah. no, no, I just uh, wanted to compare it to it. Thank you. Uh -huh. So that's the, so the, the key point is the conclusion is, is there. Uh, the hypothesis looks a little different. Um, but there is a connection. So, so in a, in a sense, uh, this curvature assumption is closer to the original Hopf conjecture, which I don't want to jump back to the first few slides. But the Hopf conjecture involved a curvature assumption, so this is a bit closer to that. Um, but the the result that I already mentioned, actually, maybe it's better if I jump back to it. Uh, it's not too far back. It's probably a more efficient way, yeah. So regarding this, uh, the Hopf-Singer conjecture, uh, sorry, the Hopf conjecture, there are these two results of Gromov and uh, these two guys, or these two sets of guys, uh, Kau, Xavier, and Joost as well. Um, and then, uh, so this is the strict form and the non-strict form, and we we can recover those those results by the theorem that uh, I just stated. But uh, but but the proof is completely different. So, I, yeah, I mean it may be presumptuous to call it simpler because you know we have to bring in all these perverse sheaves, so maybe that makes it worse, but. If you don't mind such things, then it's uh, it's actually a fewer number of pages than uh, the original proofs. So maybe that's simpler. Right. So uh, yeah, so I, I guess I'm gonna jump right into the proof of theorem one. Sorry, Donna, can I ask a question? Oh, yeah. yeah, like uh, what's the uh, connection with the aspherical part? Yeah, okay. Um, right, so I, I'm kind of, uh, Jumping around a little bit, but let me. Yeah, I didn't. I don't think I wrote the corollary. But if you, uh, if you have uh, th these kind of curvature assumptions, actually, this one is fine. Uh, that should give you. Uh, so if you change the these words to sectional curvature, which is a slightly uh, stronger assumption, then it implies a spheric, a sphericalness. I see, I see. So as a corollary, which I didn't write down, unfortunately, I should have, uh, you get, uh, you, you actually recover a, 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 a form of the conjecture that I stated before. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? 
So, you know, I apologize that I, maybe it's getting a little technical. So people should ask questions and slow me down because I uh, kind of forgot how to do, uh, I much prefer Blackboard talks. Anyway, uh, so I'm going to sketch the proof of uh, the conjecture. So this was uh, maybe, I think, maybe this is related to Shandor's question just a few minutes ago. Uh, I'm, so there's sort of two statements. And just to be lazy, I'm just going to focus on the strict version. But there's a parallel argument for the non-strict. And to get the parallel, you should replace ample with nef. So in your mind, you, you can run the, the other argument by changing a few words. But anyway, the, the, this, as I said, the, whatever this funny condition is, uh, it, it's the same thing as the, the cotangent, being, cotangent model being Griffith's, uh, Griffith's positive. And that's a fairly strong condition, but in, in particular, it implies ampleness. It's, it's probably stronger than that. But, uh, okay, so um, so then um, so maybe uh, there's another result that I need, which is due to uh, Dobson and Kashiwara, which is kind of a magic formula, which is exactly what we need, which is we need to understand this Euler characteristic. And it expresses it in terms of an intersection number between the characteristic cycle, which I sort of talked about, and the zero section of the tangent, sorry, the cotangent bundle. So just, just to remember, uh, let's say X has dimension D, then the zero section has dimension D. The characteristic cycle is uh, also dimension D because it's Lagrangian. So it's it's a two D dimensional cycles inside a two D uh, ambient space. So as a number, it makes sense, and so so uh, we can express this thing which we want in terms of something more geometric. Uh, yeah. So let's see. Yeah. Now, so it's just looks like a proof by by nothing, I'm just quoting a bunch of theorems, but you know, you, you just have to put it together. Uh, and then uh, the next fact is that we need to control the, the thing on the right. And the, fortunately, all, all of this was done by Fulton and Lazarsfeld in their famous paper in the 80s. And uh, this is using the ampleness here. And with the, this ampleness, it actually uh, guarantees that this intersection number uh, is positive. And so that's, that's the proof of strictness. And uh, for this strict inequality, rather. And for the other one, it's almost the same, except you have to change that to NEF. And then uh, here you get the non strict inequality. Okay, so it's. Uh, it's not much different. So any, any questions with that? Okay, so let me continue. So theorem one uh, is maybe, it looks like, actually you don't like these words, it looks like a kind of technical theorem, but it's, it's a, actually a fairly simple kind of theorem because it's close to the original conjecture and the proof itself is basically a, a page, well, page, you know, once you fill in the details, it's not much longer. Okay, so to get to theorem two, I need to uh, bring in a few more technical terms. So there's a definition due to Kolar and his book on Shafarevich maps. So, uh, so compact Kähler manifold X has large fundamental group. If, well, I'm sort of paraphrasing his uh, definition. So if for any, uh, non constant map from Y to X. So X is a, sorry, Y is another complex manifold. Sorry, sorry Donnie, for yeah. the interruption, but did you say theorem one implies already a theorem by Gromov and the other two people? Yeah. Oh, so that's a very short proof. 
Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So it it seems shorter to us. Um, wow. I mean, technically, you could complain that I'm using a lot of, you know, technology here. So maybe if you flesh out all these these previous results, it would be equally as hard. But if you're willing to quote various theorems by these guys, then yeah, it's, it comes out pretty short. Thank you. Sure. Um, yeah, so, uh, sorry. So, so any, any other questions? Yeah, so I'm gonna try and, this is a setup for the next theorem. So unfortunately this second theorem requires a little bit of uh, terminology. So, so X is a compact Keller manifold, if you prefer a smooth projective variety. And one says it has large fundamental group if for any non-constant map from y to x, the <clears throat> image of the fundamental group of y in x is infinite. In particular, x should be have an infinite fundamental group. So one thing it's the terminology is well, it's not my my fault, but uh, it's not it's it's not a statement about the group. It's a statement about x. So it's a property about x. Um, okay. So the next uh, statement or definition, rather, is uh, probably standard in some sense for people who like to think about groups and representations of groups. But suppose I have discrete group gamma and pick, fix the representation of rho from gamma into GLV. And there's various kinds of rigidities, but uh, the one I'm gonna use is sometimes called cohomological rigid. So it's, this is cohomological rigid, cohomologically rigid. If the first uh, cohomology of gamma with coefficients in the endomorphism uh, module of V is zero. Now, if you're trying to understand what 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 this means, it's this this is really the tangent space first order deformations of uh, of the representation. So you, if you, you you can form a moduli stack of these representations, and then this will be the the tangent space. So we're basically saying that this this tangent space is trivial. So there's no first order deformations. That's, that's what it means. Um, okay. So yeah, so there's two terms that need to be introduced. This funny condition about X, but basically we're saying that uh, to be large, uh, have a large fundamental group means you can detect all sub varieties just by looking at the fundamental group. Okay, so the theorem two uh, is actually, now I'm gonna really work with projective varieties. So let X be a smooth projective variety with large fundamental group in the sense uh, I just stated. Um, and uh, so there's a bunch of things that go into this theorem. So next, let's suppose that there exists a cohomologically rigid Ah, never mind almost. Let's just replace almost by faithful. Faithful semi-simple representation row. Um, so there's lots of words here, but I think rid cohomological rigidity I, I just explained. Uh, almost I've just erased, but I can't erase it. But faithful, you know, it just means that this map is injective. And semi-simple means that uh, it's a direct sum of irreducible representations. Okay. So that's still uh, the hypothesis. And now let's make the conclusion. The conclusion is the same. So for every perverse sheaf P on X, uh, it satisfies this inequality. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, maybe I should uh, ask if there's any questions, because this this is kind of hard to. What understand. is R going to be, or? Oh, what is it? It's just some, it's just the size of the representation. So for some R. Right? Some R. Yeah, some R. 
So I'm saying that uh, the supposed X is such that the fundamental group of X is a group of matrices of some fixed size, we, you know, with all these other conditions. I, I guess a, a question, maybe this, maybe this is a silly question, but uh, I, I expect that there, there's going to be some con uh, connection between this homologically rigid uh, representation and, and the curvature assumptions earlier. Is that? Ah, yeah, so that's going to get hidden in, in uh, well, so I'll go through the, the connection in a, in a bit. Okay. Okay. So let, let me uh, jump to now some words about the proof. Um, so why did I assume things were projective? Well, because I, I want to quote results of Eno and Groschenig and their, their result is purely arithmetic in nature. So you, you actually need X to be uh, projective. So maybe uh, I'll just uh, state the next theorem and, uh, and then see how the, these connect. So, the theorem is that let X be a compact Kähler manifold. Again, it doesn't have to be projective with large fundamental groups. I'm just carrying over the previous assumption. Assume there exists a complex variation of Hodge structure with faithful discrete monitoring. So it's again a, a long list of conditions, but it's a different list than before. Then the conclusion is exactly the same as in theorem two, that for any perverse sheaf, you get this inequality. So what I'm saying is that theorem two is a consequence of theorem three. And maybe I, it would have been nice if I could make these on the same slide, but right. So if you can remember the, the conditions on the previous page, uh, they look a little bit different. So X is, this part is the same, except I'm assuming that X is projective. And this part looks a little different, but maybe there's, there's a vague connection that here you have a representation with a bunch of properties. And on the other side, we have a variation of hard structure with a bunch of properties. And so what I claim is that if you have this representation with these properties. So first of all, we need this uh, rigidity theorem and the, the theorem of um, these two sets of authors is that if you have a rigid, cohomologically rigid um, representation, it's going to be, uh, first of all, Simpson proved that it comes from a com complex variation of hard structure. Uh, this goes through his Higgs bundle story, but doesn't tell you anything about monodromy. But then uh, more recently, Eno and uh, Groschening have shown that the monodromy is integral, in particular it's discrete. So to make a long story short, theorem, the conditions of theorem two automatically give you the, the complex variation of hard structure with all of these properties. So theorem two gets reduced to theorem three. Um, any, any questions? Uh, yeah. So theorem three is really the, is the heart of, this is really where, where one has to, this is really our main theorem actually. Uh, but it looks maybe for people who aren't Hodge theorists, it looks a little strange. So. We, we wrote theorem two to make it so, somehow more, uh, more accessible. Okay, so maybe I'll sketch the proof of theorem two, um, sorry, theorem three, three rather. So yeah, so what is a variation of hard structure? Example, I, mean, I don't want to define it, but an example is I have a family of smooth projective varieties over a, another algebraic base. And then I look at the Hodge structures on the fibers, but as I move from point to point, 
if you, if you like, just imagine a family of elliptic curves. The hard structures move in some sense. And you can measure this movement uh, by the so-called period map. So in the case of elliptic curves, it's the classical period. It's, it's exactly what you mean uh, by periods. Uh, but in the, in the more general case, it was defined by Griffiths. All right, so Griffiths associated to this complex variation of hard structure, just let me just call it a variation of hard structure, a so-called period map to uh, a period domain mod uh, a group gamma, where it's gamma. Gamma is a monodromy group of, of this variation. So again, if you want to think of an example, which I should have put, um, just do family of elliptic curves, then D is, the upper half plane that you we all know and love, and gamma would be something like SL2 of Z, right? So then this is a moduli space of elliptic curves, and this is just a moduli map from from the the base of this variation to uh, the moduli space of elliptic curves. Okay, now. All of these complicated assumptions, actually the, the, the first set of assumptions about having a large um, fundamental group will prove that this period map is finite to its image. So let me give a name to the image, which is uh, Z. And uh, the business about you know, large fundamental group guarantees that this is a finite to one map. Okay. And that's going to be important. Um, yeah. Now let's uh, so let's say that uh, this this image is non singular, which is a strong assumption. But just for the sake of understanding in one case, then basically passing there's no loss in passing from x to to z uh, because it's just a finite difference, so to speak. And uh, now Z uh, is going to sit, in, sit inside this, this period domain, or quotient of the period domain. Um, all right, so then, uh, so here I'm, I'm sweeping some details. There's quite a few details here, but one knows, thanks to Griffiths, that the period domains, well, Let's do a classical case. So maybe instead of elliptic curves, those are too simple. Let's do modular space of abelian varieties. So there you would have the Ziegel upper half plane for D and modulo something like S, SP2G of Z, right? But then the Ziegel upper half plane is a, what's, what's called a Hermitian symmetric domain. So it actually has a metric with with negative curvature. Uh, now in the more general cases, it's not quite true that you have negative curvature, but you have negative curvature in, in certain so-called horizontal directions. And that's sufficient to, to conclude that, uh, that, uh, that the cotangent bundle of Z, which is now X is net. So, the point is that we can basically repeat everything I said for theorem one, the same proof works. Okay, so this looks like the same proof, except there's a catch. I said, suppose this is non-singular and this is almost never true. So uh, in fact, in all cases that one would probably consider this is gonna be singular. So here you have to do some modifications so you you resolve singularities and you can do it with with a little bit of care so that the uh, let's say the smooth part the cotangent bundle extends to a neft bundle on on the resolution okay so without getting into too much detail uh, you can now modify the previous argument to work with uh, with um, z tilde the resolution so, I have a question. Yeah, like sure. Going from 
x to z, it's a finite map, but the usually Euler characteristic does change, no? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, so maybe, maybe no I can neg make... No negativeness is preserved. So is that what you're Yeah, saying? so so here's here's the point that I, I should probably make a selling point of why we consider perverse sheaves. Ah. So the Euler characters will change, but you consider coefficients in the push forward of the structure, the constant sheaf on Z, which is now perverse sheaf. So uh, if you allow more general coefficients, uh, then well, that's, work. So, so this is really the advantage of allowing general oh, coefficients. Oh, I see, I see. So you, you can do this kind of trick. Yeah, but uh, otherwise I would agree that you have no right to compare all the characteristics, but uh, since we're using coefficients and and, and uh, going down to the image, you are guaranteed to have no negativeness. So there are right. oh, I yeah. says because un under a finite map, sometimes it goes negative to uh, the other one, right? Like uh, yeah, yeah. Like to P one or something. That's, that's right. So so uh, right. So, so uh, things could go wrong. Uh, if, but here, uh, downstairs, so it's a good. Downstairs graph. is good. So downstairs has the right curvature. Ah, uh, yes, I see. Ah, uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so that's, but that's. I mean, I don't want to get into the technical part, which is really coming from the singularities. But suffice it to say, with a little bit of you know finesse, you can you can make it work. Which is basically the same argument, except you don't actually work with the cotangent bundle anymore. You work with some other thing, which. Is basically going to extend the cotangent bundle to an F bundle. Thank you. So, but yeah, but but otherwise it's the same. So I think that's the sketch of theorem three. Yeah, so I should do it. Maybe I should have done these examples before. Uh, uh, but yeah. don't I? I I'm yeah, sorry. Sure. I'm a pain. Uh, yeah, like. As Sandor was saying, we started with the uh, curvature thing. Yeah. And then you went on to theorem three. What is the intersection like uh, of the variety, you know, uh, or, uh, or like a, what's the relation between those? Theorem one and three? Yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll see, I'll tell you what, what happened. So we, we actually proved. Theorem three first. And then once we looked at it, we said, this is a really complicated argument. Is maybe, but maybe there's a simple special case. And then we realized, well, theorem one is actually a simple special case. So it's not that it's, so I shouldn't say it's a special case of the theorem. The proof is a special case. So basically you don't have to deal with all of this, this nonsense with singularities because the, you just assume from the beginning that the curvature is good has the right uh, curvature per sign and then everything works so i so I, I guess the relationship is is through proof yes the proof the same proof worked i see thank you uh, any other questions okay so but yeah but then yeah so we we proved theorem one is like a an example to illustrate how the proof works. And then we realized, well, actually it seems to be an interesting theorem by itself. And maybe it's more interesting than the first, than the third theorem, because it's it's easier to state, right? So that's, that's how it came out. But yeah, so, okay. So th then the question is what, uh, what examples, you know, so this, this could be a, a theorem about the empty set, uh, I mean, there's, there's this famous Milner story about the uh, you know guy who proved all these wonderful theorems, and Milner claimed, well, the only thing that satisfies that is zero. Uh, and so that you know, so there's a danger that maybe we're proving theorems about the empty set, but uh, I claim that there are examples where th both theorems one and two apply. So theorem one, maybe. Uh, just quickly remind you, it's this business. I don't want to go through the whole thing, but it's uh, with, with these curvature assumptions, you get the, the right uh, conclusion. And theorem two 
was this more complicated business where you have all of these funny words involving a representation. And the uh, question is, where, where could these come up? So the examples maybe will explain how you can find examples in nature, or at least I'd, I'd like to think they're in nature. So the first example is you take a compact Shimura variety, which uh, you shouldn't be scared by these words. I, I actually don't know what a Shimura variety is, but for me, I take it to mean a quotient of a Hermitian symmetric domain by an arithmetic group. Then both theorems one and two apply. Um, unfortunately, there's a catch. In nature, you would almost never find something which is compact. So this is kind of a cheat. I mean, you can find examples, but it's, it's rare. Um, so a good example of a Shimura variety is the moduli space of abelian, principally polarized abelian varieties. And there you definitely have a boundary. Uh, and so most examples that you care to think about, you're gonna have a boundary. So this example is maybe a little bit of a cheat, and that's what I'm trying to say. These are almost never compact, but there's a good news. And you can compactify these things, the so-called Bailey-Borel or Bailey-Borel-Sataki compactification. Uh, and the good news is the this boundary that you get usually has very high co-dimension, right? So for example, if I take moduli space of principally polarized uh, abelian varieties of, of dimension G. Um, I, I can't do the calculation in my head, but it's roughly like, uh, dimension is roughly like one half G squared. I mean, uh, the boundary is gonna be roughly like uh, one half G minus one squared. So, I mean, the whole quantity squared. So it's, it's going to have co roughly co-dimension G in, um, in there. So if, if G is big, then this, this can be a high co-dimension. So uh, now these are, these are projective, sorry, quasi-projective varieties. The Bailey-Borel compactification is, is projective. So you put it into a big projective space and take hyperplanes uh, and cut this thing with hyperplanes. And uh, you use a appropriate Lefschetz theorems and you'll find that uh, if you take enough intersection, complete intersection of sufficiently many hyperplanes, you're gonna pick up compact sub varieties. And these compact sub varieties will preserve uh, the interesting features of this original uh, X. Namely, they'll have um, uh, a fundamental group which looks like an arithmetic group uh, of the right type. And then you just quote a bunch of theorems of uh, various people like Raghunathan and Margulis, and you'll get the rigidity properties and what have you. So theorems one and two both apply to these examples. So uh, I think that's all I had to say. So thanks. All right, let's thank Tony for the beautiful talk. Yeah, I forgot <clears> to <throat> I forgot to ask how long is this this seminar? Is is it an hour or yes, or? yeah, you you're yeah. perfect. So I yeah, I mean I sort of messed up the beginning by not logging in, but uh, yeah. no problem. Hour no minus we, so. we had a good time chatting. Yeah. So any questions from the audience? I kind of asked my questions during the talk, and so did Kenji. Okay. Can I ask one more? <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. Well, uh, KLR, you know, yeah. where yeah. does that condition come in? Ah. Of course, projectivity, you know, of course, that implies KLR, but. Uh, oh, how do we use uh, KLR? Yeah. Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, so yeah, we used a we used a bunch. Well, I mean, okay. 
Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so, yeah, let's see. I guess there is a couple of places where it came up, but <clears throat> um, so, uh, so there are a bunch of things I sort of said in passing. Uh, maybe I jump to the proof. So, for example, this impl implication, I just said it like it's obvious, but actually this is going to use Kaler right there. Um, I see. So there's a bunch of places with, where you need it, or at least. <laughs> oh, no, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, I just wonder. Thank you. Sure. All right. Any other questions? Um, Let's thank Bruno again. Mm.